Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. As you probably know by now, SpaceX is building a massive, massive rocket down in Boca Chica, Texas that's never going to go to space. No, this isn't some clickbait headline. This particular rocket will never go to space because it's not designed to. Now, this is just a hopper version of their upcoming Starship that some people are calling the Star Hopper. And at first, this thing's only gonna fly a couple meters at most. But don't get me wrong, I of course am fully confident that SpaceX will eventually get an actual Starship flying and get it up to space and into orbit. But for now, that's not what this is. So today we're gonna do a quick little history rundown on SpaceX's hoppers. We're gonna explain why they build them, you know, why they're building this one, what they do with these things, uh, and then we're actually going to build one in Kerbal Space Program and show what we hopefully will see the Star Hopper do in 2019. Let's get started. Three, two, one. All Okay, now right off the bat, let me do a friendly reminder that I'm not here to speculate. I'm not here to do any rumors or any, you know, ooh, upcoming things about Starship because it's constantly changing. At this point, literally like almost every day, we get something new about Starship, the super heavy booster, the upcoming new Raptor engines, the stainless steel actively cooled skin. And at this point, it's just constantly changing so much that I'm not here to speculate. I'm just going to be teaching you guys what we actually know about Starhopper. So before we actually start, we need to do a really quick brush up on all the names and the name changes because this stuff is confusing and we just want to make sure we're all on the same page here. So uh, back before November 20th of 2018, SpaceX's upcoming mega rocket was called the BFR or the Big Falcon <coughs> rocket. The upper stage slash spaceship portion was called the BFS or Big Falcon Spaceship, and the booster was called the BFB or Big Falcon Booster. But since then, Elon announced a name change of the upper stage slash spaceship that's now called Starship, and the booster is now called Super Heavy, and together some people are calling it Starship Super Heavy, but it's really hard not to just call the entire rocket still just the BFR. So let's start off with just a quick overview of what's been going down at Boca Chica. So we first saw some glimpses of SpaceX's latest vision for their big Falcon rocket at the Dear Moon event in September of 2018. Now at that Dear Moon event, Elon mentioned that they plan to do some suborbital hops by the end of 2019. Well, fast forward to December 8th, and Elon just casually mentioned in four weeks, they would have cool pics of the demo Starship that will fly suborbital hops. Uh, four weeks. This was surely just Elon time, right? I mean, there's no way they would have pictures of a hopper ready in four weeks. But before you know it, people on NASA Space Flight's forums started showing pictures of a water tower company building a water tower-ish thing that just so happened to be exactly nine meters wide. And of course, people were just going crazy, saying there's no way this is any kind of Starship mock-up. It's clearly just a water tower. Well, those people were wrong because on December 22nd, Elon let the cat out of the bag that this is indeed the actual hopper that will perform those suborbital hops. So this leaves us with a few things we need to explain. So first off, it's kind of like a flying boilerplate mock-up or maybe just a shell of a starship over a small little uh, suborbital hopper. And, but having it look like the Starship is a bit functional, so the aerodynamics and the weight distribution are representative of Starship. But this is also so SpaceX can start taking some pretty pictures and give the public a glimpse of just how massive and gorgeous this thing's going to be. But it's not just there to take some pretty pictures with. Uh, if we want to understand what SpaceX is doing in the future, all we have to do is look back in the past, because SpaceX has literally done this exact same thing before. They built some hoppers for their Falcon 9 as they prepared to try and land them propulsively during actual missions for their Falcon 9. So let's rewind to 2011, where some journalists noticed some FAA filings for some suborbital hops at SpaceX's McGregor site beginning in 2012. SpaceX took a single Merlin 1D engine and a Falcon 9 version 1.0 tank. They attached some fixed landing legs and began to learn how to fly, or more importantly, how to land. Hello, Grasshopper. Grasshopper took its first flight on December 21st, 2012, and that lasted just three seconds, and it went 1.8 meters in altitude. So, although this was just 
literally almost nothing, SpaceX had to learn how to crawl before they could walk. I mean, now think about what's actually going on during even a small hop like this. They have to spin up the turbo pumps, they have to throttle up until the thrust is just slightly more than the weight of the vehicle, and then they have to throttle down nice and slow and gently so it descends slowly and controlled. So, I mean, yeah, just starting with a little three second hop is probably a pretty good idea. They continued to use the Grasshopper to take bigger and bigger steps for a full year, and they flew it eight times in total with a maximum altitude of 744 meters. But perhaps the most important things that Grasshopper did was perform a landing with a thrust to weight ratio greater than one. And this is called doing a hover slam or suicide burn. And this was absolutely vital for the success of the Falcon 9 landing. And that's because when the Falcon 9 comes in for its final landing burn, it weighs so much less than it did at takeoff. So not only has it obviously let go of the upper stage and the payload, it's also burnt through most of its fuel. So even with just one out of the nine engines at its minimum throttle setting, the Merlin engine is still producing more thrust than the entire vehicle weighs. So this means if the Falcon 9 were to light its engine too early, it would actually zero out its velocity before it got to the ground. And since its thrust is higher than the weight of the vehicle, it wouldn't <laughs> hover. It can't hover. Its, its thrust is too high. Instead, it would actually go start going back up. It'd start ascending. And that's a very bad thing. So performing this precise maneuver was vital in SpaceX actually being able to successfully recover Falcon 9 boosters which in my opinion is still honestly one of the single coolest things you could watch. I mean, I could honestly just sit here and just watch these every single day. So next up, SpaceX built a more realistic and properly scaled version of the Falcon 9 to practice landing, and this was called the F9R. And this thing looked a lot more like a Falcon 9, and it even had retractable landing legs that looked like the iconic ones we're now familiar with the Falcon 9, and they would eventually test out some steerable grid fins as well. As a matter of fact, the tank on this unit was actually a full-blown qualification test article from a Falcon 9, so it was the full length, meaning this thing stood about 50 meters tall. The F9R flew five times, first 250 meters, then to 1,000 meters, and then it tested the actual grid fins so SpaceX could learn how to steer and control the booster. But then there was one more flight, and then on the fifth flight on August 22nd, 2014, the Falcon 9 Dev 1, took off for its last time. Now, unfortunately, the booster had to be remote terminated when it suddenly veered off course. And that's because there was a blocked sensor that caused the anomaly. But SpaceX still moved forward confidently with the Falcon 9's landing attempts, since the Falcon 9 has redundant versions of those sensors. But the good news is these hoppers were very successful in teaching how to do hover slam maneuvers, how to precisely throttle through a landing phase, and how to maneuver around using only an engine gimbal. Now back to Starhopper, it's not going to be the first time they try to propulsively land an actual spaceship because don't forget they tried to do propulsive landings and hovering with their Dragon 2 capsule. Now unfortunately they ended up canceling propulsive landing for Dragon 2. I already have a video all about that. It's a little bit older so bear with me. But uh, it's a, still a really good explanation of why they actually canceled propulsive landing here on Earth and of course on other bodies as well. And just like with the Grasshopper and the F9R, you always want to test real life hardware. I mean, when you have new engines on a brand new platform with wildly different geometry, you want to test it and you want to test it a lot. So that's where we're at today. We're seeing literally the new version of Grasshopper, but this time it's for Starship. And just like how Grasshopper didn't have any aerodynamic control surfaces, such as grid fins, this first version of Starhopper won't feature probably anything more than a trio of Raptor engines with gimbals. And just like Grasshopper, this Starhopper only needs to kind of look the part. You know, it's really just about learning how to hop, fly, and land with a brand new set of engines and a new, much, much larger fuselage. And the fact that it's covered in roughly bolted on or riveted stainless steel plates is simply to make it look a little bit the part, because Elon likes everything even test things to look pretty. And we don't really know what's inside the shell. Most people think there's another set of tanks and that's where the Raptor engines are bolted onto. So you can almost think of it as like a F9R inside the shell of Starhopper. Maybe, but that's kind of getting into speculation land. The engines currently on the hopper are a blend of Raptor development and operational parts, but they'll soon be replaced by a quote unquote radically redesigned Raptor 
and I can't wait to hear more about that. And now lastly, we know that SpaceX applied with the FAA and the FCC to do high altitude flight tests of an experimental vertical takeoff and vertical landing vehicle that can go up to five kilometers in altitude for up to six minutes. And this of course means we're getting really close to actually seeing this thing fly. Uh, so in order to get a better sense for things to come and what they're going to be doing with Starhopper, let's pull up Kerbal Space Program and I'm gonna show you what we can actually expect. And welcome to Kerbal Space Program. And like I always say, this is basically 50% uh, rocket designer, 50% flight simulator, and 9,000% explosion factory. Now this is with all of the realism overhaul mods installed, which makes it a lot more realistic, a lot harder to use, uses a real earth, all these other things. Uh, I'll link in the description how you can try to get the realism overhaul mods. It's a long story. It's really hard to get working on your computer, but that's what I'm using here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take basically just the avionics. I'm going to stick a three meter internal tank, which again is maybe a little bit speculation, but just for, for building this hopper, it's good enough. Just a three meter tank that I'll have that'll be pressurized for the fuel. We're going to stick three engines on this thing, and then we're going to slip this big, beautiful stainless steel aero shell right down on top of this. And this looks just perfect. All right. So first off, we better just learn how to just fly a tiny little bit, just little baby tiny hops. So this is all about precise throttle control. And one of the hard things about realism overhaul is there is a delay between throttle inputs. So like you'll throttle up or down and it doesn't change right away like it normally does in Kerbal Space Program. So it's a lot, a lot harder. It's very realistic. Um, so doing this stuff, it might look easy, but it's, it's really not. And so this is just a quick little hop up to a little over 50 meters in altitude. Uh, and the hard part is that these landing legs here are about the same width as the takeoff slash landing pad. So actually performing a quick little hover is quite difficult. Um, and again, all throttle inputs are delayed. So right when you think it's like stopping, all of a sudden you, uh, it's just really, really hard. So here we go trying to center it a little bit better on this landing, on the takeoff and landing pad, but it looks like we're doing just about fine. Voila, there you go. Not bad, so that's probably pretty close to what we're going to see for the first couple flights of the Starhopper. Just little hovers, nothing out of the ordinary, up and down, nice and slow, nothing scary. And now you, before you know it, we're probably gonna see them doing higher and higher and higher flight tests, like probably up to, you know, say 500 meters or so. And not only going just straight up and straight down, but we'll probably start to see them divert and actually go sideways. You know, they did this same thing with the Grasshopper and with the F9R. They went up and would scoot over and come back down. Or I guess if they're, you know, really feeling brave and bold, they can sure aim themselves directly at the a vehicle assembly building or that tent down there in Boca Chica. And they too can try to land the Star Hopper right on top. I think that's a um, pretty good idea in my opinion, <laughs> as you can tell. Ah, yeah. I mean, come on, if I can do this, SpaceX can do this, right? I dare you, land it on a building. <laughs> Actually, to be perfectly honest, they are going to have to have more precise landings than this even, especially with the, you know, with the booster portion, with the super heavy booster, they plan to land that thing directly back on the launch pad. So they better be practicing like this. I mean, yeah, I'm sitting here kind of joking about landing on the, on the vehicle assembly building, but they're gonna have to be insanely precise. Like we're talking down to, you know, half a meter of precision of landing in order to kind of get into some guide slots here. Now you're gonna notice I'm struggling personally, not struggling, I'm succeeding uh, <laughs> in landing on the vehicle assembly building. But this is kind of relevant actually. Dang it, I definitely should have kept scooting over. But hey, that's what the stairs are there for. Not bad, not bad. Okay, so next up, let's take this thing up quite a bit higher, about 700 meters in altitude. And we are going to work on uh, turning off 
one of the three Raptor engines. And that's because this is something that they'll probably be practicing with Starhopper is making sure the reason it has three engines to land with is not because it requires three in order to have enough thrust. It's so you have redundancy. You know, Elon talked about to minimize pucker factor, they're going to end up with three uh, engines that are fully redundant. So that way, if one of them goes out, it's no big deal. But that means they are going to the, they're going to have to practice that. You know, that's, you can model that all day long, but actually getting it to work in real life, it's probably going to be a lot harder than the, you know, obviously now your thrust is offset. You're going to have to, you know, throttle to compensate and gimbal in towards the center of mass with your center of thrust now super out there. It's actually really hard. And, um, hmm, as you, Maybe seeing here, I wasn't exactly very good at it. Uh, I hope a computer is better at flying than I am. I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I believe in that statement though. But as you can see, uh, two engines. Of course, it is controllable-ish. You still have a decent amount of roll control, um, but it is going to have to fly a little bit crooked in order to actually stay maintaining its orientation and and doing a nice slow touchdown it's going to be difficult but it's something they're going to have to practice is what if an engine goes out you know how that's something that the falcon 9 currently if the center engine goes out they're pretty well screwed um sometimes they do three end landing burns but i don't believe they have any contingencies yet or they've ever practiced what if one of those three in the middle of the landing burn goes out. Um, I don't know what the Falcon 9 can do. The Starship, on the other hand, has to be able to do that. You know, we're eventually talking about this landing on Mars. We're talking about this landing potentially uh, point to point Earth transportation. We're talking about this thing needing to be airliner like reliable. And if you can't have a, you know, an engine failure in the middle of your landing burn and survive and have it really be no big deal then that's not reliable. So this is something they're going to have to practice. And I hope they do a lot better than I did because uh, yeah, this, I know it looks pretty easy, but it's a computer's obviously going to have to be doing a lot better job than I am because yeah, look at that. <laughs> it took me a, a couple times and I had to add some better landing gear, but yeah, I eventually got a soft touchdown with just two engines, but Again, I think they'll be doing a lot better job than I will be. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that they're going to have to go pretty slow on descent, at least with the fixed legs on the Starhopper, because although, you know, this is pretty stable going up, when you're coming back down, now you basically have wings or fins at the front of your rocket, and uh, the actual Starship will have the ability to, to bring those legs in, not fold them, but uh, kind of fold them in dihedrally. And that will help eliminate a lot of those aerodynamic effects. But on Starhopper, you know, they're going to have to be nice and, and slow because they don't really have any other aerodynamic control services to control and compensate for the center of lift slash center of drag being uh, basically in the front of the vehicle when it's coming back down. So they're going to have to go nice and slow, take it easy, um, which uh, there's a lot of stuff they can test out with a Starship Hopper. And it's going to be really cool. I... I really hope it doesn't end like the F9R, but there's going to be a lot of really cool tests they're going to be doing with this thing. So this brings up the fact that clearly SpaceX will eventually be building a much, much more advanced version that has aerodynamic features and large control thrusters so they can start practicing that absolutely ridiculous belly flop to tail down maneuver that's going to be the key to Starship success. Of course, I've already done a video all about how Starship will re-enter belly first and then go tail down. So if you need more on that, definitely check this video out. Uh, but we do know that at some point, maybe even by the end of 2019, we'll actually see a stainless steel Starship complete with the giant flap air brake things, the moving forward fins and large powerful control thrusters. And Elon mentioned that eventually they're going to be doing supersonic re-entry of the Starship down at Boca Chica. They're going to fly out over the Gulf of Mexico, turn around, come back super fast and practice that landing sequence. That will be absolutely amazing. And fun reminder, last we know, at least, the control thrusters won't be cold gas thrusters. At least, according to Elon. Tip out of space by now. But in the Mars entry, you showed the, the craft coming in kind of on the long side. Of it. That's right. So how does that have that enough control for you to get pitch it up and actually put a tail down? Are you talking about other really heavy thrusters that can... Yeah. Yeah, there'll be heavy-duty control thrusters on the spacecraft. 
Um, and there will be, there will be coal gas, there will be um, gases, uh, methane oxygen. Um, and I mean, we're talking pretty, pretty powerful for as attitude control thrusters go, as the grip that goes. I mean, we're talking 10 ton thrust type thrusters in Europe, or, or if not more. So for today, that's all I want to talk about with Starship and Star Hopper, at least until we get some more concrete information. I mean, like I said, at this point, this info is just kind of trinkling in all randomly, and it'd be literally a full-time job right now to stay on top of all these little changes and speculations and rumors. There are really good resources for other groups of people and other organizations that are doing a really, really good job of, of digging into this stuff and finding out all these fun things. Uh, like the ones that I pay attention to the most are nasaspaceflight.com, Reddit, slash r slash spacex of course the spacex group on facebook there's uh teslarati.com and then of course scott manley is doing a phenomenal job as well staying on top of this stuff so i'm actually going to wait until we hear and learn more about the actively cooled stainless steel heat shield and talk more about you know things like the radically redesigned raptors that might have like dual expansion nozzles and all these other rumors and speculation uh, I'll wait until Elon does a presentation or really gives us some hard facts to talk about. Um, but meanwhile, we have a lot of stuff to look forward to in 2019. So stick around. I've got plenty of videos coming. I have a list that's literally like ever growing. I can't seem to chip away at it fast enough. Uh, but of course, I wouldn't be able to do this stuff full time if it wasn't for my Patreon supporters. So if you want to help support what I do, head on over to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. But also, while you're online, be sure and check out my brand new web store where I've got really cool new exclusive shirts and some fun hats and mugs and prints of rocket launches, uh, grid fin nada coasters, lots of fun stuff. Check it out, and while you're there, you can click on music where you can stream my music anywhere you listen to music on Spotify and iTunes and all that stuff. Um, or right here on YouTube, I've got a playlist. So check that out while you're online. Let me know what you think. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.